you've got a Bible with you, you can open it to uh, the book of Jonah, which is about four-fifths of the way. I don't know how far it's way. We're, we're in this series of uh, uh, messages from the minor prophets. It's towards the end of the Old Testament, and each one's only a couple of pages. Uh, and uh, today we're going to look at Jonah. And then on Tuesday night at 7, if you're courageous, we're going to have uh, Jeremy's going to lead us in a Bible study on the same uh, minor prophets. We'll look at it a little bit different on, on Tuesday evening. And if you're brave, you come. So the word of the Lord came to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa and he found a ship bound for that port and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Let's pause there. Lord, teach us, teach us from your word. Teach us uh, what it means to follow you and to not be offended by your grace. Amen. Now, I started with those little verses because that's what Jonah's the book starts with. And it begins with a very clear message from God, right? There's no confusion in that. You go, bring this, but preach against them. You know, it's not necessarily good news in preaching, but it, uh, deliver that message. And it says that Jonah turns and goes the opposite way uh, to get away. I'm not doing that. And uh, now sometimes in our lives, have you noticed that we get really rebellious and we just, you know, we know what God wants us to do. We know where we're supposed to go. We know what we're supposed to, how we're supposed to respond in situations. And we choose willfully to go another direction, right? Sometimes, though, that's not the case. Uh, some people are directionally challenged, and they hear, where, they know where they're going, they're very clear about it, they're careful in the getting there, and they just can't seem to get there because they're all over the place. Uh, yesterday, Eileen was in uh, the great city of Redmond, which is like Nineveh, a place of great sin and degradation, you know, by the way, and we should go and preach against it, but uh, so she's over there uh, for a conference, a writing conference, and uh, she checked into her uh, hotel, the Marriott Courtyard, because I was saving her some money. And then in the morning, she was supposed to go up to the Marriott Town Center where the conference was being held. That cost five bucks more, you know, so I'm saving her bucks. So it's about a 15 minute drive. Three and a half hours she drove <laughs> yesterday morning. She started at eight and she got to the place just before noon and that's with five or six phone calls to me where I got out the computer and the Google <laughs> map and tried to help her find her way, you know. How is that possible? I thought of the church. <laughs> I can't help it, I thought of the church. I thought this is exactly what happens uh, when a group of people are following Jesus together and we know where we're going, we know where we are, we know where we're going. We've, she had a map that they gave her at the front desk at the Marriott Courtyard. She knows how to get there. And you know, you just, when you're dyslexic, you just turn the other way. So every time it said turn left, she'd go right, okay. And go right, literally. And so um, sometimes that happens in our life, but either way we find ourselves going the opposite direction, whether it's willful and disobedient and, you know, determined or whether uh, we just seem to not be able to respond to what direction we need to be going. Either way, we end up going an opposite direction. And Jonah is, was not like Eileen, okay? He was not directionally challenged, but he was able to know where God wanted him to go, where he was, and then turn and go the opposite direction as far as he could. And I got to tell you, no matter how careful a driver a person is, like Eileen, she's very careful. She obeys all the laws, the speed limits, everything. She signals appropriately. When you're in Issaquah, heading south to Tacoma, it's really hard to find that Marriott. <laughs> I'm just telling you, I'm just saying that, you know. Now, this uh, passage today, that was on the side thing. Okay, I just want to tell you that. Um, this passage in Jonah, I, I've got to tell you, of all the characters in the Old Testament, 
uh, that a person could relate to. For some reason, Jonah and me hooked up. I don't know, is it the willfulness? Is that I want my own way, I, you know? And, uh, and I, I just go, Lord, why couldn't I have been, you know, one of the gentle prophets? And why did I have to be the cranky one, you know? But that's, that's my gift. And, uh, and so we, we find with Jonah this uh, willful disobedience. And, and, and as we look through, you, you all know, you ever heard about Jonah and the whale in Sunday school? Anybody go to Sunday school? Jonah and the whale? Okay, first of all, it doesn't say whale. Okay, so I just want to say that. But, um, so he gets on this boat and he's headed the, the other way and a storm and everything and he's paid for his uh, fare to go and they're sinking in the storm and what do we do? And so Jonah says, well, it's probably me, you know, and who cares anyway? Uh, I don't care about my life, so why don't you just throw me overboard, kill me, and then you guys will all be safe. What a, what a testimony, you know. It's probably me. And so they do. <laughs> you know, he, he went, no, I was kidding. That was just kind of a sermon illustration. <laughs> and, and, he, and they go, no, let's do it. So they chuck him into the water to drown. And, and God doesn't give up on him. And I think that's the point of this, this little uh, uh, minor prophet book of the Bible. God doesn't give up on him even when he's willful, even when he's totally disobedient, and even when he, he knows what God wants and he said, I'm going to do the opposite. God says, you know, I'm going to stick with him. So when he goes the opposite direction, where does God go? With him. You know, and sometimes, you know, we find in our lives, we make a choice, okay, am I going to do this or this? I know God wants me to do this, but I'm going to do that. Sometimes we think when we do that, well, God's not with it, but actually he comes with us, right? And he says, do you still love me? Let's, let's, let's try this again. You know? so, so God rescues him in some bizarre way, you know, <clears throat> swallowed by a fish and then vomited on the beach. You know, it's like, whoa. Um, and, uh, but he's now in Nineveh. He's, God's got him back there. Okay, so now you have another chance. This is grace. God is showing Jonah grace. Okay, you didn't like it before. You went the other way. All right, I kept you from drowning. I saved you. You're here now. I've got a message to give. Well, um, what's Jonah to do? So he said, okay. So he goes and he delivers the message. Forty days, ruin is coming upon you. You will all be destroyed. Not just you, but your animals too. All of them, you know, no pets. Everybody's going to be destroyed. God is wiping you out because of who you are and what you've done. And you deserve it. No question about that. And you all had it coming. And so that's the message. I'm done. Talk about a sermon. You know, I've preached some hard sermons, but not, not Jonah-esque quite yet. Maybe it's still coming. But um, now, now here's the interesting thing. Why didn't God just destroy Nineveh? He said, go and tell them they're going to be destroyed. Why didn't he do it? Instead, he says, go tell them in 40 days you're going to be destroyed. Is that so? They go, oh, geez, it gets worse every day. I get more anxious, you know, closer to destruction. God gives them a break. He said, well, why don't you think about this for a while? You ever thought about that? Well, you've got some time, you know, pray about it. Talk to your friends, get in a small group, go to church, you know, and you Ninevites, and, uh, and then uh, this miracle happens, right? They change. They repent from the most lowly, it says all the way up, the word spread one to another, and they repented, and then the word got to the king, and the king repented, and the whole land uh, repented and changed. And you go, well, that was some of the most effective preaching, missionary service that a person could have. Jonah was really a success, right? And uh, it says that God saw their repentance, saw their hearts, and had compassion, and didn't bring judgment. If this would have ended, that's the way it always ended in Sunday school, right there at that point, right? And, and, and it would have been such a good 
moral lesson for us all. You know, God loves us and has grace and compassion, and if we turn to him, then everything will be great. Let's go to brunch. Right? But, you know what I don't like about the Bible? It never stops there. And then it gets personal, right? It gets really personal. And so we find God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. He had compassion and did not uh, bring upon them the destruction that he had threatened. And then chapter 4. But Jonah was greatly displeased and became angry. He was furious. Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? That's why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew, I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God. Talk about it. it's really slamming the Lord. I knew you were gracious and you were compassionate. You're slow to anger. You're abounding in love. I knew that about you. A God who relents from sending calamity. I knew that. Now, Lord, take my life. I just want to die. Ta-da! <laughs> the total Westphalian view. I, you know, sometimes we get this idea that God is judgmental and, and he's going to be angry with us and he's going to really bring his wrath and, and, and we sort of portray God. In fact, maybe you're one that's had that idea of, you know, I like the New Testament God. You know, people share that all the time. I like the New Testament God. He's loving and kind. I don't like the Old Testament God who's vindictive and mean and judgmental, right? What is this saying out of the Old Testament? I knew you were loving. I knew you were compassionate. I knew that you would back away from this judgment stuff and, and that you'd bring grace. I knew it. And I hate that. <laughs> Imagine Jonah's disappointment at God's love. Deep, abiding disappointment that God was just the way he knew he'd be. Loving. Gracious. Slow to anger. Ready to forgive. Now the interesting thing to me is that Jonah was not furious about God's love and grace and giving him second chances when it was applied to him. Right? He was disobedient. He was just as much a, a, a hooligan as the Ninevites. And, um, and God keeps him from drowning. He rescues him. He brings him out. He takes him there. He didn't even have to buy a ticket to get to Nineveh this time. You know, he didn't return the flight. And, and he gets him there. And, he's, and he still has the job for him. You know, he didn't lose the job. And he still gets to, And then he's very successful in the job. God was full of grace and second chances for Jonah. Right? But Jonah doesn't want that for others. This to me became a symbol of the uh, what was wrong with missions in the world. You know, I grew up in a mission field in Africa and, uh, and I believed all my life that it was the most racist, uh, sometimes arrogant exercise because it was very hard back in the, back in the old days when, when I was there, it was hard for people to celebrate grace because they were so prepared for the judgment and they had a great message of judgment and, and when and when God didn't act the way they wanted him to act then it was uh, uh, upsetting and, and and here we have a person who's delivering God's message to the people it needs to be delivered to but he doesn't care for them he doesn't love them he doesn't want a relationship with them he's doing this for one reason to get God off his back yeah. that's it you know and I thought, well, bless you, Jonah, in that. Uh, what a motivation. But it's like, okay, God, leave me alone. I delivered the message. Right. And Jonah now is suicidally depressed because of grace and love and compassion. It's not what he wanted. It's not what he wanted to see. He wanted to see everybody destroyed. And God says, even the cattle? Yeah, 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 kill the cattle too. Yeah, we want it all. Um, 
You know, so I get, I get kind of convicted of this because I think, you know, how many times in my life have I uh, had a message from the Lord? <laughs> and then it's so stunningly uh, inappropriate when people respond to God and, and they, their lives do change. And I'm, I'm so used to lumping them into a certain category or, you know, they're this way or that way. And, and, I, and I feel comfortable once I pigeonhole somebody into a, into a category. And then when, when they break the category and grace comes in and the categories are all destroyed, what am I to do? I'm no longer in charge. And I think Jonah would rather die. Just kill me, Lord. Let me die. I don't want to live in a world where there's grace and love. Why? Why would somebody say that? Because in a world where there's grace and love, he is not in control. He is not in charge. He has no control over God's grace. Now, guess what? We don't either. We really don't. And I think God loves to surprise us I think he loves to surprise the world. I think he loves to catch us off guard and show us our kind of pettiness and all those things. But we've spent so much of our life building a worldview and a ministry view and a life view and how things work in the world that we don't want to give that up. We would rather die than, love, than live with love. How can this be? Now, Jonah takes it another step, and that is he becomes really petty. A little plant grows up, gives him a little shade. He's really happy. It says, hey, I got shade. And then the plant dies. Now he's bitter at God. How dare you kill this plant? You know? And God goes, you didn't care about the 120,000 people and the animals. You don't care about that. You only care about this stupid plant. Yeah, so? <laughs> see, now you see why I so identify with Jonah. The pettiness is, is beyond belief. Now, I want to talk about something, though, the difference between judgment and judgmentalism. You heard those two words? God gave Jonah a message of judgment to bring to Nineveh, right? If this happens, then that happens. There are consequences for behavior. There are consequences for your choices. I'm just alerting you that this is going to happen. That's judgment. Judgmentalism is what Jonah brought to the table. It's not about consequences, it's about I don't like those people. I don't want those people to have grace. I don't want those people to feel loved. I don't want those people to live. I don't even like their cattle. That's judgmentalism. And I think that sometimes we get confused in, in church and, we, and we, um, we think we're delivering a message of judgment, of simple consequences, but it actually becomes judgmental. And, and we begin to take on that. If we could just figure out who's worse than us. We're, you know, we know where we stand. Now, um, I think sometimes I get this opinion that um, when I'm here about consequences, anybody ever talked to you about, you know there's consequences for your baby, you know, my parents used to do, it's right until the moment they died. <laughs> you know, John, there's, uh, if you do that, you know, it, it always sounded like it was kind of punitive, right? If you don't shape up, you know, you can ship out. My dad was in the Navy, so, <laughs> so we had that. But, um, uh, and it, it's affected my driving. I've got to tell you that. Coming down from, uh, we live in Shoreline, in the Sardin there, and if we're driving, anybody live in the north end up Edmonds, -y, sort of that Shoreline area? Okay, if you're coming down kind of the back road, not Aurora, but the back road, they have this one little street. You, you, you go to the street, it's right by the uh, Shoreline Community College. And no kidding, as long as I've lived there, and I drive a couple times a day past this, it starts with a big triangular sign. 25 miles an hour, 25, you know, speed limit. Then the next sign, it's uh, that uh, beware of ice sign. And then, that's not enough, 
Then they have that squiggly line, dee, 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 you know, because you're about to go up the hill. And uh, so it has a squiggly line. And then there's another 25 speed limit sign. Talk about overdoing it. Then they have a pillar with these two orange lights blinking back and forth, back and forth, day and night. Doesn't matter. It could be summer sunny blinking. Blah, 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 blah. Now I'm thinking, okay, how many signs? This is all happening in about a quarter of a block. Bum, 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 bum. Do, you, do you know this place? Okay, so I'm not lying about this. And I think that is such an overkill. I'm a good driver. Sometimes I do it in my Miata and it is designed, well, it's, it's designed for city traffic in Tokyo, but it can be used on these roads, you know. And so I, I like to kind of zip up the mountain roads, you know. And, uh, and then when you get into these curves, they have these big signs with like black arrows kind of saying, turn, turn, you know. I think they must think we're idiots. They must, you know. So the second time I got pulled over by the police and, and, and given a ticket, both times ticketed. I have a ticket from there too. You do too. Oh, this. Uh, thank you for that testimony. So it's not just me who has control problems. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So you know, the second time the cop pulls me over, and I'm thinking to myself, what? a stupid deal this is. I mean, I'm a good driver. I'm not, you know, my car can do this. And so I go, this is such a stupid speed, and this is where I'm talking to the cop, you know, in love. Uh, you know, this is so stupid, this is just a speed trap, this is just a shoreline making money thing, you know. <laughs> they just set that all up there, you know, to trap good citizens like me, and you, I guess, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, and, and, and you know what he says? Actually, you may think that this is a problem, it slows you down, all those things. Actually, when your car skids off the road, if it's lucky enough not to hit an oncoming car, it will just go off the road into the uh, canyon there. And then it really takes a lot of time to come and tow you out. <laughs> okay, now, see, I think what he was saying was judgment, not judgmental. He, was, he wasn't saying that I was a terrible person, although he probably thought that. Yeah, you know. but, but he was saying, you know, if you do hit that patch of ice and in Seattle the roads are sometimes wet and it gets a little cold and it'll, it'll freeze, you are going to go off that road no matter how good a driver you are. Especially when you hit it, sir, at excess of 40 miles an hour. Who ever heard about radar? <laughs> and, and so, um, the second time, <laughs> yesterday it was only 38, sir, you're getting worse. You know, so, um, so the thing is, you, I'm, I'm going, all he's saying is, when this happens, this is the result. And I think we need to take that seriously, but you know, God says to us, uh, and throughout scripture, do this, don't do that. Live this way, treat people this way. If you don't, ah, they're gonna be pulling you up out of the ditch, you know? Don't make them do that. Uh, you, can, you can do this and that and the other. And, and, and it's not being judgmental. God is not wrathful and angry at us and, and putting these uh, prohibitions in our life because he wants to irritate us, though I'm sure the Shoreline City Council did, but um, he's saying when this happens, this is gonna be the result. Save yourself that. Trust me. Now several times in this book of Jonah, God speaks really clearly, and I love that the, the way that, that the writer puts this, you know, God goes to, the word of the Lord to Jonah, go to the great city of Nineveh, preach against it because its wickedness has come before me. Verse three, first word, but Jonah, but Jonah, but John. That's what the cop said, <laughs> but John. And then later on, God saw what they did, how they turned from the evil ways. He had compassion. He didn't bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Chapter 4. But, Jonah. 
But Jonah. And you can put your own name in there. It's judgmental if you put my name in there. You put your own name in there. But what? I think we need to take that out and say our own name and how we respond to what God's clearly calling us to do and to be. We don't have to fight. We don't have to be willful. And we don't have to uh, find ourselves lost in the other direction. We actually can be deliverers of grace if we would not be disappointed in God's love. So that's my challenge to you this week. Look at your life and look at your relationships and look at your ministries and look at your situations and say, Lord, help me not to be disappointed in your love today. Help me not to be disappointed when I see your grace this week. Help me in this situation to not be furious when I see your forgiveness lived out. And we're going to need God's help because that is not something that comes natural for us Jonas. Not you all. I'm just talking to me. Lord, help me to not be disappointed in your love today. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your love is astounding and it's, and it's uh, sometimes shocking, particularly shocking in that you love all of us. Even the people we can't stand, you love. And so we pray that you would give us the courage to not be disappointed in your love, but to, but to look at people and situations in life with, with your eyes and your compassion and your heart. Help us celebrate your grace and not be furious at it. Give us the courage to love like you love. That's our need. That's our prayer. In Jesus' name.